Our first speaker, uh, we have Adelina Sindejas, uh, Deputy Director of the Broadband and Digital Literacy Office of the Department of Technology. Good morning, and thank you, Bill. Um, welcome to our Digital Access Summit. Uh, it looks like we have a good um, amount of, of people here attending, so thank you so much. Uh, we have lined up, as Bill said, um, I think an excellent agenda today with some um, expert speakers for you. And um, today you're going to hear about policies, initiatives, and projects that are improving our broadband infrastructure and bridging our digital divide. So it is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who will be providing our opening remarks, and that is Director of the California Department of Technology, Carlos Ramos. Carlos was appointed Secretary of Technology in 2011 by Governor Jerry Brown. As Secretary of Technology, he is a member of the Governor's Cabinet and CIO for the State of California. Prior to his appointment, Secretary Ramos headed up his own consulting practice, and prior to his appointment, um, he served also as a member of the Human Services IT Advisory Group as an ERP advisor to the State Controller's Office. An EHP advisor to the Department of Corrections and as a senior fellow with the Center for Digital Government. Throughout his career, Secretary Ramos has been a leader in many of California's key technology initiatives. He has served as director of the Office of Systems Integration with a multi billion dollar portfolio for California's largest technology projects. He concurrently holds the or held the position of Assistant Secretary for Health and Human Services and has the agency senior technology um, ex and um, was the agency senior technology executive. Please welcome Director Ramos. Good morning. It's nice to see all of you. Uh, Barbara, one thing that she left out in the uh, Sac State, go Hornets, <laughs> Sac State alumni. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, a, a couple of things that I wanted to say to start off. Uh, so, so you might be wondering, okay, so is it secretary or director or what the heck is this guy's title? Uh, so um, last year as part of the governor's reorganization of government, uh, one of the things that he did is he created an agency called the Government Operations Agency. And I think it's a great idea, you know, I'm surprised nobody had ever thought about it before, is to take all those organizations, those departments in government, whose job is primarily administrative, you know, to, to service government, uh, and bring them all together under a single uh, line of command or a chain of reporting. Uh, so he created the Government Operations Agency and appointed a Secretary of Government Operations. And then he took our department, or our agency at the time, and folded us in there. So that's why uh, my title went from Secretary to uh, Director. So now I am actually officially Director Ramos. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I wanted to say thank you to all of you and uh, welcome to the California Digital Access Summit. I want to thank you for joining us here today uh, to come together and find out ways of or talk about ways in which we can empower California citizens and to improve their, di their lives and their experiences through digital access and digital literacy. Uh, it's no secret, you know, I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir and some of the things that I'm going to share with you today. Uh, but it's no secret that California really is, as far as states go, a leader in this arena. And I think it started back when the governor signed the executive order that uh, required and created a digital literacy framework and established the state's broadband council. Um, and I think it's through partnerships with organizations like Link America, like the California Emergency Te or Emerging Technology Fund, and organizations like TechWire that we're going to maintain that position of leadership. So I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank uh, those organizations for their partnership and all of you that are going to participate today because I think that maintaining that position of leadership is very important. So as we go through the morning, you're going to hear from a wide variety of speakers and stakeholders in this effort and this partnership of driving California forward and driving towards closing that digital gap. We're going to hear from organizations that are working together and collaborating on different efforts and on different uh, initiatives to try and drive that, that gap to a, to a more narrow gap. I do want to share with you that, uh, you know, my role really hasn't changed in government. I'm still the state CIO. And as such, my responsibility is driving California forward from a strategic perspective 
in the way that we invest and deploy technology. So at the state level, we've been doing our part too. And I wanted to start off actually by sharing with you a couple of, uh, of initiatives um, that we've been working on in the last couple of years, specifically in the technology arena. Uh, the first and foremost of these is that we put out a strategic plan for the state around IT. And what that plan does is it lays out a couple of objectives and goals for state agencies and says, this is what we need to be looking, shooting for. These are the initiatives that we're trying to achieve. Uh, our very first goal in that uh, strategic plan is that we're encouraging agencies to leverage technology to make government more accessible, more convenient, and more effective in serving its constituents. So I wanted to share with you just a couple of examples of things that we're doing in that regard because, you know, I am at heart kind of a techie. <laughs> and so kind of a nerd, I guess, is more, the more official term. <laughs> uh, but we've been doing some cool things in technology in the last couple of years. Uh, so let me, sh let me start with talking to you about our, uh, you know, our observations that, by and large, you know, consumers are leveraging mobile technologies a lot more in their personal lives. They communicate that way. They transact business that way. They play games and, you know, access entertainment that way. So we thought, okay, maybe government ought to get into this space too. So in the last couple of years, uh, we became the first state to develop our own mobile app store. And what we did is we went out to the agencies and we said, we're going to create a common template for you. We want consumers to have a consistent experience in government. So we're going to create a template, we're going to make it available for free, and we're going to encourage agencies to put uh, applications and services and transactions uh, online through this mobile app uh, gallery. We call it the California Mobile App Gallery. So today, we have dozens, literally dozens of, of mobile apps in there available again for free, where you can do things such as check traffic conditions. So any of you come in on Highway 50? <laughs> so this would be a good app for you to have. Uh, you know, last week or a week and a half ago, we had April 15th, right, tax day. So one of the apps that, you can, that we have there is an app where you can track your refund status. You can do things such as check what the status is of any wildfires that might be going on in the area. Um, you can make reservations with, at state parks. Um, you know, it's gardening season, so, you know, you go out into your garden, you see something that, some kind of bug or something that you're not familiar with, you, they, we have an app called Report a Pest, where, you know, if you find, and it's not just for your neighbors, <laughs> it's actually for insects <laughs> or other, uh, other things that could be of a, a challenge to you. Uh, but, you know, there, there's a whole host of applications that really help make your life a little easier. Uh, you know, I do a little bit of jogging every now and then, so it's nice to be able to check the air quality. Or, you know, a couple weekends ago we were cleaning out my garage and I needed to find a place to, to go drop off all our e-waste. So you can find locations of e-waste. Or you can find the location of farmer's market. There's just a whole host of applications that you can, that you can use that are available, again, online for free uh, to make your life a little easier. Another very cool thing that we've done is, uh, is our geo portal. And so what we did is we went out to the different state agencies and asked, okay, how many of you have maps of California, geo maps, uh, interactive maps that, that provide data about California, but in a mapping format? And what we found is there were literally thousands of them, over 11,000 of them. The challenge was nobody knew about it and nobody had access to them. So what we did is we created a portal where we put all those maps on there and made them available in a very easy to use uh, user interface. And so now you can go online and find things such as, you know, what's, what's the, you know, relative performance or educa educational attainment of the schools in your area. You know, if you're looking at where you're going to buy a house, you know, the Megan's Law website is out there with maps. Uh, you can find DMV field offices. You can find, uh, you know, areas where there's seismic safety or you can find out things such as, are there schools that have summer meal programs? You know, some very critical and important services for, for individuals in California. We're also pushing forward in the use of social media. So now you can go on YouTube, you can find out, you know, are there changes in law that affect driving in California and how do they look? If you have a young, a young uh, teenager looking to get their license, they can actually go on YouTube and, and you know, practice taking a, a driver's test. They can also see on there some of the, you know, changes in law and, and what it would look like in real life on the street. You know, there's a change in law that says you, you have to yield to a, to a truck coming on, you know, facing you in traffic. So we're using, we're encouraging agencies to use social media as well. You can follow the governor through his tweets. 
So there, there's, there's just a number of things that we're... And then finally, we're putting hundreds and hundreds of services and transactions online. So as an example, today, you can file your taxes online. You can register your car. You can apply for unemployment benefits. You can apply for health care coverage. You can get a professional license. You can get a fishing license. You can find child care services, find a, child, a smog check station. You can reserve a campsite, apply for admission to a university, a state university, or you can apply for scholarships and financial aid. Again, you know, those are just a small example of the, of the hundreds of services that government is putting online and making available to citizens. We've got some other cool things that are coming. Uh, we just recently released a drought website where you can go online and find out, you know, what's the status of our reservoirs? How does it look after each, after each storm? And what sorts of resources and assistance programs are available to folks that are impacted by the drought? And pretty soon, we're going to be releasing an open data website where we're going to make other sorts of data, of government data, available, again, for free online for, for folks to use. And the, the cool thing about that is it's also going to leverage cloud technologies. So I have to tell you, as, as CIO, I'm really proud of those accomplishments. But there is a bit of a challenge there and a bit of a drawback. If you don't have access to the Internet, none of those services are available to you. None of those things are. If you don't have the digital skills or access to a computer to use those, then you're not going to leverage any of the return on those investments. And that's a big significant challenge for us in the public sector. One of our requirements is to provide equitable access and services to constituents. And the fundamental fact is, if you're not digitally literate, if you're not connected, you're being left behind. So that's a big challenge for us. We have a long ways to go here in California in closing that digital divide. We've made some progress, that's true, but we have a ways to go. I'm going to share with you a couple of, of statistics, which, uh, which, again, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but I think still call and challenge us to action. So in California, it's estimated that just under 70% of Californians have, have a, a broadband connection to their home. That's really good, and it's better than most states. But as you dive deeper, we find some troubling trends. So, for example, if you're a Latino household, your chances of having a household uh, broadband connection are just over 50%. And if you're in a low-income uh, urban community, your numbers drop to below 50%. And that's pretty concerning. What we find is in order to reach to 80% of, of uh, connectivity, we need almost 900,000 additional California households. To, to develop and have access to broadband connectivity. The challenge is going to be that half of those households are going to be of income levels below $40,000. So for us in, in government, that's a big challenge. And we're looking to all of you to help us address that challenge. What it means is that our target is going to be low income, urban. It's going to be Latinos and other uh, minorities. It's going to be tribal communities. It's going to be the disabled communities. And it's also going to be the rural communities that are underserved. So we, we see that as a big challenge. We're doing some things in that regard as well that I'd like to share with you. But for government, it's not only a recognition that we have a gap that we have to close, but it's also a recognition that digital inclusion and digital literacy have a big impact on our state. Digital connectivity and digital literacy increases productivity. It improves the quality of life for Californians, and it enhances our state's competitiveness on the global scale. I think about this. You know, I have three kids, and my youngest one is in college now. The other two have graduated. But I used to give them a speech, and it was a pretty standard speech that, that would tell them, you know, if you want to have a good life, you've got to be able to support yourself, which means you have to have a pretty good income nowadays. You know, some of them, one of my kids loves to travel. The other one, when he was going through school, he was all into the name brands, right? So he wanted, you know, Nike tennis shoes and P. Diddy hats and all these other things, uh, Sean, Sean, Sean John shirts or whatever it was. And those things are expensive. So I used to tell him, you know, you're gonna, if you want to maintain that sort of a lifestyle, if you want to travel, you know, if you want to have a, a, a decent life, you're going to have to be able to support yourself. Try supporting yourself without, knowing, without having good reading skills or good writing skills, or good math skills. And nowadays, I think for 21st century students, you have to include in there, try doing that, try having a good job or a decent career without good digital skills. 
You know, if you're a student nowadays, try competing with other students if you don't have access to the web or if you don't know how to use a computer or can't bring one with you. So in that regard, we're doing a number of things there as well. Let me share with you some of the things that we're doing here in government and specifically some of the things that we're doing through my department. Uh, first and foremost, we recognized this need early on. So when Governor Brown came in, we established an Office of Digital Literacy and Broadband Connectivity. We also established an Office of, of Digital Education. And you're going to be hearing from some of those folks uh, a little later today. And so through these two offices, we worked on a number of, of initiatives that I'd like to share with you. Uh, first and foremost, through the Broadband Council, one of the things that we heard is, hey, you know, part of the reason and part of the challenge with providing uh, access and, and broadband availability, connectivity to some of, let's say, the more rural areas or more sparsely populated areas is that there really is not much of a market for some of the big time providers out there. But what we did here is some of the smaller providers were willing to go and, and give it a shot. But for them, infrastructure was a challenge. So we started to work on an effort to, to try and identify opportunities where folks could co-locate co infrastructure on state property. And so through this effort we've done, through this geo portal, we've mapped out where the, where the locations where there, are, where there are state property or public properties that are potential sites for co-location of infrastructure. We've also created educational videos about what's the permit process like for, uh, for getting those, because again, some of the smaller providers might be less familiar, let's say, with, uh, with how you go about doing that. And we created an ombudsman to help and assist in the permitting process. We've also reached out to tribal communities to share with them and you know, some of the technology services, including telecommunication services, available through the state and, and through leveraging the state's buying power and making that buying power available to them. Uh, I saw our director of our data center over here. So we've also shared with them some of the, some of the technology services available to them through the state. We participated in national efforts to build a nationwide interoperable interoperable radio system called FirstNet for first responders, which is a particular challenge, again, to organizations that are out in, uh, or to communities that are rural or sparsely populated, and to our tribal communities. And um, focusing on, on, you know, how do you provide access not only to connectivity, but also to, to actual computers and uh, training we found literally hundreds of state, identified and found hundreds of state surplus computers. And we worked with organizations like the Department of Corrections and the Prison Industry Authority to say, hey, how can we refurbish these? How can we load them up with you know, current software? And then how do we get them out into the communities that need them? How do we get them out to the nonprofits? How do we get them to low income schools? And now we're working on a, pro on a program, I'm sure you'll hear about it later, about how do we get them into the homes? And so through that effort, we've, we've distributed hundreds of computers out there. And the other neat part about that is by working with uh, some of these youthful, youthful offenders and some of these programs, vocational rehab programs through the Department of Corrections, you're teaching job skills that are very marketable. And it's not only about how do you, how do you work with computers and how do you refurbish them, but also how do you package them? How do you distribute them? How do you ship them out? All very good, good uh, skill sets that are, that are gonna help in that regard. And finally, we're also reducing the amount of e-waste going into the environment. So we're working on programs like that. And uh, one of the things that we're working on that I think those of you that will be here in July that will brave the traffic to get out to Cal Expo are going to see is we're working with the Department of with the California Exposition and State Fairs to start building a showcase in the California State Fair that showcases California's technology heritage. So we've reached out to Silicon Valley and said, you know, at the State Fair every year, you know, we showcase our agricultural background. We showcase California's, uh, you know, pedigree, let's say, in that area. You have wine contests. You have, you know, industrial applications and, you know, mechanical sorts of things that you see out there. What if we started to show, showcase our innovation and our work in technology? What if we started to showcase our, te our Silicon Valley background? And so in partnership with them, we're going to be taking on a number of efforts and activities at the State Fair to do just that. And so our, our hope is, one, showcase innovation in, in California, but also get the Silicon Valley companies to, to start investing in bringing this out, one, as something that to look forward to, maybe reach out to fairgoers and say, hey, why don't you come and try some of this technology 
and maybe start to consider a career in technology and look at that as a career path. So there's a number of things that we're doing. Fundamentally, we're focused on trying to close that digital divide and trying to shore up that digital gap because we see that for the state, for the people of California, it's a competitive advantage to do that and it's a means of enhancing our service as a government to our constituents. So I'm looking forward to the partnership with all of you in doing that. I'm looking forward to hearing the speakers who are going to come in and challenge us, I think, and in some cases give us really good ideas of how we can do that uh, better. And so I'm looking forward to a lot of momentum coming out of this, out of this event as well. So I welcome you. I, I, I appreciate your participation, and I appreciate your partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos, especially for um, your inspirational words and also for updating us on the department's projects, but especially on those cool things that we're all doing. <laughs> um, and also, truly, for your support, the department's support in really moving this um, really worthwhile and critical initiative forward. Um, so now we're going to move on to our first broadband speaker. And um, our keynote this morning is a good friend of mine and um, somebody who comes to us from the federal government level, level and that is Ann Neville. So Ann currently directs the State Broadband Initiative at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration at the U.S. Department of Commerce. Um, in this capacity, she is responsible for both the national broadband map and grants to states to support the emerging digital economy, including local and state broadband planning broadband and technology use, broadband data collection, and OpenGov and Gov 2.0 efforts. Before this, she was a global leadership fellow focusing on IT and telecom at the World Economic Forum in Geneva, Switzerland, and has served as Assistant Secretary of Economic Department of Technology for the State of California, where she served as the lead staff to California's broadband initiative. In Anne's early years of work, in this area, she managed a grant program to increase nonprofit capacity through the use of IT and founded and directed a community center providing technology training and access to mainly immigrant populations. Please join me in welcoming Ann Neville. Good morning. I was, uh, I was very excited when Adelina asked if I uh, could speak today because California is the place where I really learned the impact that broadband availability and technology adoption could make in a community. And I wouldn't have had that opportunity in as many places because in 2000 there were few states who were as committed and had as much organized activity around this issue as California did. From San Diego to Fresno, from San Francisco up to Happy Camp, there were thriving communities of people who were working to expand access. The state and the nation really wouldn't be where we are today without the commitment, creativity, and the passion of so many people in this state who have and still are dedicated to making sure that every Californian has the opportunity to take advantage of the digital economy. So today in 2014, the technology that people are adopting is different, but the impact that it going online has on someone's life is really just as momentous as it was almost 14 years ago. And that is to say it's really life-changing. Today, as we become ever more interconnected, the penalties, however, for not getting online continue to grow. Because someone who is offline has far more limitations than they did 15 years ago. As many of you know, we are quickly moving to an online only as opposed to an online option economy. Whether you're talking about jobs, services, or even everyday things like getting coupons. So knowing how quickly the landscape changes, we must continue to plan for the digital future that we want to see. And it was only seven years ago that the iPhone was released, that Netflix began streaming, 
its own movies. And during that same year, 2007, is when California was writing its first broadband plan. While there are still fantastic pieces about that plan that I think will stand the test of time, and I say that in the most objective way that someone who is intimately involved in writing it can be, <laughs> I don't think anyone would argue that stakeholders shouldn't reevaluate the goals and the roadmaps from several years ago when the landscape has so dramatically shifted. You know, it's changed in terms of what technology is available, the speeds that consumers and institutions can now access, and even the applications that we now consider standard. But the environment to support digital access has also changed. And there are five factors that I think have really come into play that didn't exist in the same way seven years ago. And those are funding, policy, new models, partnerships, and collaboration. So I want to talk about some of those this morning. And as California is thinking about what its next steps are, think about some of these and how they may apply. So starting with funding. In early 2009, just over a year after California published its first broadband plan, the President signed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. As a result, of the Recovery Act, the federal government invested $7 billion to increase availability and to drive adoption. $4.4 billion went to NTIA, the organization uh, at which I work, and $2.5 billion went to USDA's Rural Utility Service. At RUS, the BIP program currently supports 255 active infrastructure projects around the country. BTOP awards at NTIA have built 112,000 fiber miles, connected 21,000 anchor institutions, and created 631,000 new broadband subscribers. We have 50 state broadband initiatives, over 250 local broadband planning teams across the country, and we built a national broadband map. The programs have been a success because of the dedication of the people who took the words that they wrote on a grant and turn them into reality. And many of those people are here in California. Truly some of the most fascinating, the most replicable, replicable, the most scalable projects have been here in this state. So while those Recovery Act programs are winding down, or some of them have already come to an end, the federal government is still providing funding to expand broadband, but sometimes you have to look in different places. At RUS, they have several programs that they've had for a long time, uh, which are really important places to continue looking. The Telecommunications Infrastructure Loan Program, the Rural Broadband Loan Program, the Community Connect Grant Program, and the Distance Learning Telemedicine Grant Program. RUS made $324 million in broadband grants and loans in 2013. On the electric side, they've also made loans to co-ops, who are deploying smart grid technologies using fiber optics. And some of those electric co-ops have gone on to become broadband providers in their community. At the Appalachian Regional Commission, they're funding infrastructure and planning activities as well. The FCC's Connect America Fund uh, had a $4.5 billion annual budget for this year. And the fiscal year 2013 cap for E-rate was $2.25 billion. The FCC has also been accelerating broadband deployment, making it faster and cheaper to access utility poles and through what is known as the wireless shot clock, uh, where depending on the application, it sets a limit of 90 to 150 days for the review of wireless siting applications by local and state uh, governments. The federal government has been making other policy changes as well. Some of you know how much federal land there is in California. You may not know that across the country, 30% of all land and over 10,000 buildings across the U.S. are owned or managed by the federal government. In order to leverage this national asset, uh, uh, as in order to leverage this national asset, the president in 2012 signed an executive order to increase access to federal properties and roads for broadband infrastructure construction. As a result of this EO, there are now a few very practical outcomes. There's a new mapping tool uh, that includes property and federal land uh, locations. And for each location, 
contact information, environmental and historical data, and broadband availability information. There's a new broadband inventory toolkit that also provides a central location for permitting forms, lease applications, and things like that. The General Services Administration is in the process of, fin of uh, finishing consolidated permit applications, and these will be good across multiple agencies. And to really geek out on uh, administrative things here, OMB has a new omnicircular uh, that is very interesting and may also prove to have opportunities for organizations uh, applying for federal awards and seeking funding around broadband and technology. So at NTIA, we are also seeing the outcomes of the construction projects uh, as those middle mile operators are starting to connect with last mile providers. We're also leveraging the outcomes of our broadband grants so that they don't only benefit the communities where uh, where the dollars went, but any community that's looking to access, uh, that's looking to expand broadband availability and adoption. Uh, building on the great response that NTIA had to the Broadband Adoption Toolkit in 2013, we are in the process of developing more tools and convenings to raise awareness about the business and funding models that work, the collaborations that have been successful, and the technical and human resources communities need to expand their own digital footprint. So funding and policy is absolutely one of the pieces that has changed since 2007 because none of these things were in place then. The broadband programs made significant changes in unserved and underserved communities throughout the country and they created capacity in every state by enabling state broadband offices to exist and to support a great many replicable and scalable models. In California, the Emerging Technology Fund, Computers for Youth, the City and County of San Francisco, the Housing Authority in San Bernardino, Mission Development, Economic Development Agency, Zero Divide, UC Davis, and the Foundation for California Community Colleges have all developed programming that works. I'm sure they've also discovered strategies that didn't work. And it's imperative that we leverage these now instead of just letting these programs wither on that proverbial vine. And that comes to the next piece that I think has really changed since 2007. And that's collaboration and partnerships. Is there more collaboration right now today? I'm not actually sure. But does there need to be if we are going to bridge the gap between non-adopters and adopters and between unserved and well-served communities. Yes, emphatically yes. It cannot be done without this. So here are some examples to that point. In Western North Carolina, there was an unserved pocket of homes, a small community that was nestled in amongst a bunch of communities that had access. The state broadband office there employed a team member who lived in that area and was tasked with expanding access and adoption there. He helped bring together community officials and several local broadband providers who were providing service in the adjacent areas. The business case to serve this community by one provider didn't exist. But the business case did exist when the providers collaborated with each other because they had a vested interest in this local community and they lit up the community. In rural Big Water, Utah, whopping population of 472, the town joined a regional planning team to advocate for better broadband in the town. The Utah Project team spoke with the Utah Education Network, which is sort of like the scenic of Utah, and they determined that a local school was going to be receiving wireless access through an E-rate funded connection. So then the project team contacted the provider and is connecting, that is connecting the school and as a result, the provider is now working with the community and they're developing a plan together to deploy a residential wireless offering. Next, libraries. So many of us know they are not just centers of books, they are centers of information. In Idaho, Maine, and Colorado, libraries are partnering with workforce investment boards. Workforce centers exist within the libraries because libraries are often closer to a community than the nearest workforce one-stop center. 
In Colorado and in Maine, the libraries and the WIBs have worked together to build employment support services into the libraries. This is a critical partnership because it's incredibly difficult to thrive in today's society without digital literacy skills. In fact, in Rhode Island, the digital literacy curriculum that the state created through one of our federal awards is now being implemented into all adult education programs statewide. In Maine, adult educators are improving their digital literacy skills so they can incorporate those skills into the, uh, into the classes that they teach. The question is why? Adult educators who have very little resources, who often uh, have very few training opportunities, why are they so excited to participate in this kind of training? Why are they, uh, why are they doing this when they've got so many other competing issues for their attention? It's, and it's because if they're not teaching these digital literacy skills, their students are going to have an even harder time not just finding a job, but keeping a job. So these are critical partnerships. They're leveraging resources which decrease costs, which increases the chance of funding, and these partnerships create outcomes that wouldn't have existed otherwise. Partnerships today are also more important because frankly, the low-hanging fruit has been picked. The strategies for providing online opportunities for the unconnected will have to take different partners and different perspectives. Libraries, workforce investment boards, veteran services, grassroots nonprofits, underserved community youth and senior organizations, they all have a stake in this because they serve key communities who are not online at disproportionate levels. So if you're thinking about engaging in, in a program, you've got to partner with the organization whose roots, whose hands, whose services extend into the deepest pockets of those communities because those deepest pockets are where you've got the largest group of people who today aren't connected. So the five facets that I think have changed fairly significantly since 2007 are funding, policy, new models, collaboration, and partnerships. And when you say it like that, Broadband and digital literacy doesn't sound so different from many other policy issues. But we still have a hard time getting our message across. Sometimes a group clearly doesn't see the relevance of broadband or digital literacy to their work. It is critical then to think about how to position the issue in a way that resonates with that particular audience. I was talking to a colleague. Uh, who had one of the grants that she worked through our program had received ongoing funding. And she asked, how did you get the funding? How did you convince funders to fund it? And the answer was, I stopped talking about broadband. And I started talking about the outcomes and the changes in the person's life. And that's not always going to be true for all funders, but it's something that's critical to think about. So, from a funding perspective, this policy has historically not had a single funding home. The broadband, the Recovery Act investments were pretty unique in that way. Um, instead, typically this issue has woven itself into other activities, uh, whether it's health, education, civic engagement, public safety, workforce, economic development, and so on. I know that one of the, the, uh, one of the next panels is going to talk about economic vitality. Well, seven years ago, broadband didn't come up as a high priority issue when you were at an economic development conference. It does today, and that is a great and significant win. However, too many times, people are still asking, aren't we doing okay? I'm okay with my broadband. I thought we wired those classrooms back in the 90s. <laughs> How much speed does a library need anyhow? Why do we care about a gig? There aren't any applications that you need for that today. And the fact is, we should be incredibly proud of our accomplishments, but we also have to look toward the future. You know, people sometimes incredulously ask, incredulously ask whether we'll ever be done. And I go back to Antonia Stone. She started a nonprofit in 1980 in New York City dedicated to overcoming the inequities between those who had technology, computers at the time, and those who didn't. That was 1980. 
Today, the inequity clearly looks different, but it has the same impact on the people who don't have access. When people ask today, whether will ever be done, I think that instead, we should answer and we should ask them if they expect that we'll ever stop innovating. Because if we do, then we'll surely catch up. Every disconnected person will have the time to get connected. But the fact is that we as a nation keep innovating. The skills that define someone as digitally literate will continue to evolve. The local and state broadband plans will have to change in response to their communities, reflecting what they need today and what they think must be available for tomorrow. And just as the technology innovates, so, much, so must our response to closing the technology gap. One of the greatest reasons for gatherings like this is that they can foster new and innovative, new and innovative ways to get the unconnected plugged in. With the diverse stakeholders that are here in this room, we have the opportunity to see funding, policy, model programs, partnerships, and collaborations as outcomes of today's event. There are still too many groups of people who are unable to take advantage of the educational, the economic, the health care, and the social benefits of technology. And California, along with a lot of other states, has served as a testbed for implementing new and successful ideas to improve access and adoption at local and state levels. It's offered a space for stakeholders to convene a plan for not only what a community or a state needs today, but also what it will need in 5, 10, and 25 years into the future. So I don't know what California will write in the next chapter of its broadband plan, but I do know that I'm very excited to read it, and I hope that the seeds of that are planted at today's event. Thank you. And we really appreciate you joining us this morning and sharing your experiences on California's Thank you so much for sharing, sharing policy, new models, as well as the importance of what we all know here, uh, and that is truly the collaboration and relationships that need to be formed. So, um, and then personally from my side, I'd really like to say thank you so much for your commitment to our state and really partnering with the departments and specifically myself to really move this initiative forward. So with that, um, I think we're ready to move on to our first panel. So, um, <laughs> and, um, so our, our first panel is um, a uh, set of speakers who will discuss initiatives and projects that impact and will improve broadband deployment and economic viability. And moderating that panel is my good friend Barbara O'Connor, Dr. Barbara O'Connor. So I guess I do have a funny story here. So, okay. you know, we received all these bios for all the speakers. And so when we received Barbara's, it was a page long. And so I was like, goodness, how am I going to look at how to do this in the short, you know, three and a half hours that we have for this event? So we were chatting last night, and, and so I told Barbara, Barbara, you know, I got your bio, and how about if I just say you're awesome and you've done it all? <laughs> and I'm old. Oh, no, no, no. So anyway, so she's like, just say these few things. But, you know, I tried to still incorporate as much as I could in those few thoughts. So... Here goes. Barbara is a board member of the California Emerging Technology Fund and a member of the board of directors for AARP. She is a nationally recognized expert in the fields of political communication and telecommunications policy and applications. Barbara has taught at four universities and is the author of numerous publications on political communication and telecommunications policy and applications. She served eight years by appointment of the governor the California Legislature, and the Superintendent of Public Instruction as Chair of the California Educational Technology Committee. She was featured in Newsweek's 1995 50s for the Future, a feature on the 50 people who will set policy and direction for global communications. Barbara has always blended her teaching, research, and community service into a consistent commitment to explain the role of media in society and its impact 
on citizens, institutions, and the democratic process. So with that, Barbara, I'll let you introduce your panel. Yeah, and she studied Fortran and Pascal when she started <laughs> and asked me how much I've used that since. Um, I was supposed to talk about economic development, but I think both Carlos and um, Anne covered that front. And we have speakers who are actually on the ground doing it. So what I thought I would do instead is give you a brief history, uh, mi one minute, <laughs> of how California got where we are today. And it's why I stay in California, so it's a motivation to me. When I was in Annenberg uh, in the early 70s and late 60s, getting my PhD, I was motivated by the Black Panther Party. And it became apparent to me that access to the media and technology was how disaffected groups would have access to the spoils of an economy. And that is the case, and it's more apparent now as our two prior speakers talked about it. So when I came back to California after serving time in DC, uh, I came to Sacramento. And coincidentally, Jerry Brown was governor the first time. And so uh, I had founded the public radio station here, which was technology in my mind at that point. And he called and said, we need to get this thing called CalCom going. And Dave Levier, who's here, was uh, then with the chancellor's office, which governed my behavior. And so we did a thing called CalCom. And it was basically a, a roadmap to get state agencies connected, way ahead of anybody else. So we tapped the Silicon Valley, and uh, that started sort of the evolution of where we are today. Because at the same time, companies were buying each other. And so we dealt with a vision of what an intelligent network should look like, and who should have access to it. And Ileana, who's here, and Brenda Kempster, were then working for PacBell which we have long since lost. Um, and so that report was issued, the Intelligent Network Task Force. And it's actually very prophetic because it talks about the people who won't have access. And then it was big computers. And they, of course, grew much smaller. And now I carry all the things mobile with me and access anything I want. And during that era, we had money, which Ann talked about, because the uh, California Emerging Technology Fund was created as a result of all the telecom mergers. And fortunately for all of us, the state constitution requires that public citizens benefit from any corporate merger in the telecom industry. So we were formed to really uh, close the digital divide. And I was an original director there, and we hired Sunny McPeak, and she runs around the state giving away money and driving people crazy. <laughs> but our goal is to spend down by 2017 and close our doors. And um, Anne's point, I think, is illustrative of if you want to define innovation and staying up with it, we may have to change our goal. You heard Carlos talk about the fact that we're still behind. We're better than most states, but we're still behind. And uh, we've done a lot of groundbreaking work in California. The digital literacy framework came out of work that many of us did uh, for the Educational Testing Service and the European Union. And then the Governor uh, Schwarzenegger signed the broadband plan. We have the uh, CISF fund at the CPC. There's a lot of money rolling around. But I think the key lesson, Department of Ed has new money coming from the federal uh, government, is to collaborate. And industry is not good at collaboration, especially in the tech sector, because they all want wins. But if you read the New York Times this morning, you know we have another big merger coming. Uh, they, approved, they approved yesterday the, the death of net neutrality and are allowing fast lanes for money. Uh, and I'm not necessarily against that, but that's going to open up more opportunity to close the digital divide. And I view it as that. It's an opportunity to educate people. And digital literacy is the key to that. You'll have a whole panel on it. We have the Comcast merger coming. It's another opportunity to get funds as a quid pro quo for allowing monopolies to take over. So hope all of you will be with us on that. And um, you know, I think the challenge keeps me motivated. What I have migrated to at AARP is a thing called AARP Tech, because many of the people that are my age don't have access or skills. And it isolates them. It prohibits them from having the benefits of telemedicine. It uh, prohibits them from interacting with their family in distant locations. 
So it's wildly successful. We launched it last year, and now I refer to myself as geezer tech because I'm 66. So, you know, it's kind of interesting, those of you who are my age, to see what the technology is. Uh, it has changed so radically, but the need to have it has only grown. And the divisiveness of not having it is only worse. So I am delighted to have you all here today. We probably won't close the doors of CETF because we keep getting more money. Uh, and our, our whole role in life is to get to 99% uh, adoption and use. And we're not there. Uh, and we're not there for a lot of reasons. And so we have, you have the report. I'm not going to bore you with reading our big initiatives, but it's out there on the table. Uh, our plan is to keep trying. And I think you can't get discouraged. And I must tell you, I am not discouraged. You know, having been through all these battles, I think we're further along than I thought we would be uh, in many ways. And the consequences of not engaging on it are horrible. So hopefully all of you have the energy I have had. And this panel certainly does. So I'm proud of them and the work they're doing. Some of them are grantees of ours. Some of them are not. Um, all of them are collaborators, uh, because I think anybody who accepts the mission uh, agrees to play by the rules, which is to help each other, uh, to help get money, to help what works, what doesn't. That's our role. And all of you are doing the same thing, and I see our new state librarian, my friend Greg Lucas up there, and he's had many lectures from me. The libraries have been fine. They have been great partners, and Jared will talk about that. But we changed the order of the panel just a little bit. Uh, and we have Barry as an addition uh, for Karen, who's out today. So bear with me. I want to give a couple of uh, bio comments. And those are also printed, so I'll be brief. Uh, Jared Keller's going to go first. And he's the chief information officer at the California State Library. He's also a former student of mine uh, many years ago. Um, <laughs> that always helps when you have students in high places. Uh, that was my motto early on. Uh, and he is really, he and Stacy Aldrich, who was here before, many of you remember Stacy, uh, early on bought the mission of libraries as really the hub uh, for those who are underprivileged or underknowledged. Uh, and it's a place where we put a lot of energy over our cultural history. And now it's a place that's just humming with technology. And often, even in the smallest places that don't have broadband access at home, you can go to your local library, have high-speed access, and get help and knowledge. And I'm delighted that that mission is still the library mission. In fact, it's more so the library mission than it's been in about 40 years. So Jared, take it away. All right. OK. Okay, sounds good. So, uh, you know, for first, I'd really like to say uh, thank you to Barbara because I remember it was back in 1995 sitting in one of Barbara's classes late at night because I am a night person, not necessarily a morning person, as Barbara knows. I remember talking about this broadband thing, and boy, little did I know how far it would take me, and you know, really just how important um, it is. But, you know, today I want to talk to you about a real historic opportunity that's going on in the California public libraries. It truly is a game changer for libraries and all Californians. But first, just a little bit about California public libraries. In California, we're organized in jurisdictions. We have 183 library jurisdictions. We have 1,115 outlets. So we have presence everywhere. Um, our libraries are heavily used. Last year, we had over 160 million physical visits, over 757 million virtual visits. We've issued over 22 million library cards in California. That's one of the highest in the nation. We have over 20,000 PCs in our libraries. And those PCs last year were used more than 38 million times, basically equivalent to the population of California. What does this say? It says that our libraries are very important. What it also says, too, is that there is a need for Californians to have access. PCs were used more than 38 million times. That's very revealing. This doesn't even count the number of Wi-Fi, a number of Wi-Fi sessions that people use, because 89% of our libraries provide Wi-Fi connectivity. So what this means, it means that there's a need for access, and libraries have been playing that role as the great equalizers in our community, as Carlos said and the other speakers have said that you know not everyone has access 
and they have to turn somewhere for not only access, but helping make sense of all this information and everything that's out there. And libraries serve that role. They serve as the great equalizers. However, our libraries have struggled to provide these services. You know, as more and more things go online, the really clogged connections that our libraries have, our librarians really struggle to be able to deliver the services that our communities want. To give you a little history, back in 2009, California State Library got together the entire library community as well as others partners out here with the Gates Opportunity Online Grant. And it was the first chance that we sat down and thought about what is the value of broadband connectivity in our libraries. Fast forward 2014, governor's proposed budget to provide fundings to help increase broadband connectivity in California public libraries. It's been a long road and I'm going to tell you how we got there. Uh, CNIC, the Corporation of Education Networks Initiatives in California, approached the California library community a couple years ago. And they said, hey, why haven't libraries been part of CalRIN? CalRIN is the research and education network that connects the UCs, the CSUs, the K through 12s, and the community colleges. Big, huge consortium effort that helps drive down prices and be able to provide enhanced broadband to um, those educational communities. So this is a discussion that's been going on and on for a while. Last year, as a result of AB 101, the California State Li Librarian was tasked to do a broadband needs assessment and spending plan. I will say that I was much younger before this started and have aged significantly <laughs> since then. <laughs> but really, so this was a monumental effort. This, as a result of this, we have created the most comprehensive assessment of broadband connectivity in, any li in the entire nation. This is a very powerful data set. Not only does it look at what would we do if we had enhanced broadband, gigabit connectivity in our libraries, but it also looks at how much do we currently pay? What are our upload? What are our download speeds? What does the community want? But it also looks at the actual physical premises themselves. Do they have enough, enough electrical to provide additional broadband support? Do they have uh, HVAC? Is there location permanency? So it was really, it's, it really is huge uh, record-breaking study that has revealed some very interesting information about the status of our connectivity in our libraries. First of all, this is how important it was to our library community. 97% of our directors responded to the survey, part of phase one of our survey, which is uh, juris our jurisdictional information survey, which basically looked at what, what would you do if you had unlimited connectivity. Then for our branch needs assessment, we had a 95% return rate. This is huge. I mean, you never see return rates like this on surveys. And let me tell you, this was a very difficult survey. And why is it so high? Because it's important to our libraries. Because we are where the community turns when you need access. And we, we're the only place that provides that free access without having to buy a hamburger or a cup of coffee. So <laughs> what does it show? <laughs> it's true, guys. So. What it does show is that our libraries provide a lot with very little. In, out of 1,115 library outlets, 27% of those have T1s or below. 14% are getting by with a 5 meg connection. 44%, these are the lucky ones, may have 50 meg or below. Only 13% have 100 meg or 500 meg. And even more shockingly, only 2% have a gig or better. So that basically turns into about 32 branches in California. I mean, truly, this is sad. I mean, you know, California is the land of sunshine and happy cows, but when it comes to broadband connectivity in our libraries, it's just not there. So what this has done is this has really helped get a really good movement going in California. And it has also resulted in Governor Brown proposing uh, $3.25 million in this proposed budget for connecting our libraries to Scenic. What this is, this is the great equalizer for our libraries because what it allows us to do is to move forward in consortial efforts with the other education community 
to help drive down prices, to take advantage of E-rate opportunities that our libraries do not take advantage of today because they don't have staff to be able to fill out the forms to do the paperwork, to apply for CTF funding that they currently do not do today because there is not staffing or there's not knowledge of how to do it. It also allows us to enter into bulk purchasing agreements and to actually save money to redirect existing costs. Currently, we estimate we're paying between 14 to $8 million a year statewide for library connectivity, which is getting us very little. By going into consortial efforts, by partnering, it will allow us to either spend the same amount to get significantly more, and then for that money that's saved, be able to move those towards last mile connectivity. Truly, this is a game changer for California public libraries, and it's a game changer for all Californians, because it's about giving those who need connectivity, the connectivity that they deserve, to be able to try to provide gigabit to all of our libraries so that everyone who does not have access to online resources can be able to experience them the way that people do at home, that those that do have access to help make for a healthier and stronger California. <laughs> Some of the librarians, by the way, were early, and, and, and uh, Jared knows this, were early uh, proponents of the E-rate. And they were also integral in developing the digital literacy framework. Every time we tried to work on it, we had to talk to a librarian. Because they were the front line, basically, for people who didn't have digital literacy skills. So it's fitting that we are all interconnected through the library. Uh, it really is a Mark Twain kind of world we live in again, actually. Barry, next to me, is sitting in for Karen Wong because Karen had to go do something really big for FirstNet. And those of you know her uh, know she usually comes to these things, but she sent a more than able uh, representative and we're delighted he's here. He is the general manager for the Bay Area Interoperability Regional Communication System called Bayrix. It started in August of 2011 and it's a joint powers authority representing the Bay Area public safety agencies across seven counties and over a hundred cities. He has a great background for this because he's been at the granular level. He went to San Diego State and got an advanced degree in TV and radio, yay, um, and has followed sort of the path of growing with the technology, even franchise to cable system. So he's the right person because he's put together all of those early cooperatives that are back together again, trying to make sure that we have access. And FirstNet has a lot of money. So every time I sit next to a FirstNet representative, I try to think of things to ask them for. Uh, the, la <laughs> the last time we were together, we were talking, not Barry, but Karen, we were talking about using state fair sites, which they are using for first responders as a hub for wireless connectivity for people who didn't have it in rural areas. So. Think broad when you think of FirstNet, and welcome, Barry. Thank you so much, Barbara. I appreciate the very kind words, um, and I uh, am filling in for Karen. I know she wanted very much to be here today, and uh, we just was uh, too, too many different things on, on the schedule. Uh, so I will try to fill in for her. Um, I um, am going to talk about FirstNet. I, I really want to do three things today. Uh, first is to try to set the stage with public safety communications and provide you a little bit of background and understanding about how we got to FirstNet. Uh, second, I want to talk about FirstNet. Uh, I don't really have the time to go into a lot of details. It's a pretty complex entity, but I'll give you some highlights. And then the third thing is to suggest some possible areas of collaboration and sharing and partnerships between this public safety project and some of the other uh, broadband initiatives that are going on in the state. Uh, and I think there's going to be sharing opportunities both ways, and I'll talk about that uh, in just a few minutes. I did want to point out, though, uh, just off the top, before I forget it, and listening to uh, uh, Mr. Keller talk about the libraries, uh, what, one thing I tell people is that we think of FirstNet as a public safety network, but the public safety user definition for FirstNet, I believe, can be a very expansive. And just to, as one example, library systems can become key information uh, resources during an emergency or disaster. And so I could actually see how library employees and library system staff could become 
uh, FirstNet users in an emergency to help provide information out to the public. Uh, and, and some libraries become evacuation centers, centers where people go for information when, this, when, when the big one hits. And so, uh, you know, I, I... And it will. And it will. <laughs> Uh, and so I would, in, on the top of this, encourage everyone to think, uh, you know, expansively about FirstNet. Uh, but let me go back, and I don't know if they were able to get uh, the, the slide up. Um, so, so to set the stage a little bit about public safety communications, wireless communications, where we are today, uh, most of you know, and, and the, the image of the firefighter with the walkie-talkie, that, that really is the image of public safety communications. It's voice communications. It has been for many years that there are private land mobile radio systems that have developed, been developed in each jurisdiction uh, across, across the country. They're reliable. They are what's called mission critical. Uh, the, the firefighters, the police officers depend on them. They know that they usually work and they usually work by pushing one button, and so they can get their communications out there quickly and easily, simply. Uh, there, there are limitations to the voice network. Uh, they're narrow band systems. By, by definition, they're not built for broadband. So they're really limited to voice communications or very low speed data communications in some, in some cases. It's a patchwork quilt of local networks. Each jurisdiction has built its own public safety network very limited interoperability or the ability of public safety officers to take their radios and move to other jurisdictions and have them work well. Uh, also, many of these systems are getting to the end of life. They're, they're a very high refresh and upgrade costs to, to implement new technology in the voice communications arena. And so that's, that's really where we stand with public safety. It's been primarily voice focused uh, communications. On the broadband data side, uh, where there is broadband data connectivity for police and firefighters, it's co standard commercial cell service. It's your smartphones, it's your air cards. There is no real public safety data communication service. Uh, it, it's highly interoperable. You can use your smartphone virtually anywhere, well, anywhere that, where there's service. Uh, and, and so, so the interoperability is less of a problem, but the, there are issues with the commercial cell network. It's not hardened for public safety. By hardened, we mean, uh, you, you know, the, the cell sites are built with enhanced uh, reinforcement to withstand uh, disasters. There's higher security, higher backup power for these sites to have them operate during, during uh, an emergency. The, the, a lot of the commercial sites just don't have that. And we have seen in the past that, that uh, in, in big events, um, Hurricane Katrina, uh, the, some of the storms that they've had on the East Coast in past years in the Midwest, the cell systems aren't, they go down. They're not always reliable. So that really brings us to FirstNet. It, and and it, it, it's interesting because in the public safety arena, you really have your own sort of digital divide. Uh, you have officers, you have 20 year officers, the, the, the old guys, the old men and women who, who are on the police force and firefighters, they're perfectly comfortable with their voice service. They, they're happy. But you have a new generation of officers that are coming along who've grown up with smartphones and social networking. And they get on, on the force and they say, what? <laughs> Come on. There's this whole new world out there that we could use for, uh, for public safety and, and first responders. Uh, and, and for that reason, the applications that are focused around public safety haven't developed as rapidly as, as the, the social networking and the, the, the smartphone apps that you see for, for the general public. Um, uh, so that is the arena. That's the setting the stage for FirstNet. FirstNet was uh, a, an initiative that was enacted by Congress uh, and uh, was signed by the President on February 22, 2012. Uh, it came from years of lobbying by, by public safety leaders to try to get some initiative on the federal level for a broadband data network exclusively for public safety. Uh, and it set up FirstNet. FirstNet, the, the, the legislation did really three key things. It set up a governing board, a FirstNet board of 15 um, individuals who, who will lead and guide the effort. Uh, it uh, allocated spectrum. Uh, specifically spectrum from the D-block, 700 megahertz spectrum to use for the network, and it allocated seven, up to $7 million of funding, uh, which will come from the, uh, the broadcast incentive auctions that the FCC will be holding. 
Uh, the Congress fronted FirstNet $2 billion of that $7 billion up front prior to the auctions to allow them to get a jump start on the network. Uh, so, so there's funding, there's spectrum, there's a governing body in place. This is a huge job. Let me tell you, this is a huge job. And what I do sometimes is I just kind of list FirstNet's to-do list. They have to build and design a nationwide network from scratch both the technical side, the operations side. They have to make it sustainable. You know, $7 billion only goes so far. It's not going to cover ongoing operations of the network. They have to collect information from each state. Each state will end up getting a specific state plan for deploying the network in the state. Uh, that's 50 different state plans plus six territories, 56 different plans. And you know California's plan is going to have to look much different from, say, Wyoming's or Delaware's. Don't even get me started on Alaska. How are they going to cover Alaska? Uh, so, so and, and then all of the other pieces to building a standalone network from scratch, FirstNet has to deal with. Um, FirstNet is required. And, and they're going to really need our help. They're required to consult with federal, state, tribal, and local entities on the needs and the, the available resources to build this network. FirstNet also has to look at and implement local infrastructure, state infrastructure, federal infrastructure, where it's feasible to help uh, build this network. So, so they will be basically coming to the state of California and doing a consultation, evaluating, inventorying what available assets there might be here to help build this network. Um, and in fact, the, um, the NTIA has established, uh, through the same legislation, uh, has established a uh, state and local implementation grant program. California received uh, a, a total of seven, uh, over $7 million. Uh, some of that was matching funds from the state. Uh, to, to do this planning process. Uh, Karen Wong is the state point of contact for, um, for FirstNet here in the state. And we have set up a 14-member uh, a, uh, board called the California First Responder Network, or CalFERN, Cal on the state level to, uh, to, to help guide the state in this planning and consultation process. Um, so how is this going to work? Well. We're not exactly sure yet. <laughs> We're working on that. But, but what we do know, what we do know is it's, it's going to take a lot of cooperation and partnerships between the state, between the local entities, between the um, uh, infrastructure providers. Um, hopefully the commercial cell carriers will be involved, uh, the utilities. Uh, they're gonna, there's, this is going to be a huge job in collaboration. And, and uh, we're just getting started, so we'll have to see how, how this all works out. But um, it, it's, it, it's going to be a challenge. Um, let me just kind of get toward the end here um, and talk a little bit about the way I see this working. And th these now are really sort of my personal comments. This is not FirstNet. This is not the state of California. This is just my kind of experience and ideas about what, what we might see. Um, we're certain FirstNet will need to use some existing radio sites, some existing fiber backhaul infrastructure, some existing microwave backhaul infrastructure to connect everything up. Uh, but we will be working with public safety agencies and ju local jurisdictions and the state to determine where the sites are that might be available to, uh, to use for FirstNet um, network. Uh, we have we've talked with um, municipal fiber owners. We've talked with Scenic, um, with the state uh, fiber network, uh, and, and several other uh, providers about sharing resources. And that's going to have to happen to make this work. Um, the BTOP projects. Uh, Ann talked about the BTOP projects earlier. Um, many of the BTOP projects deployed infrastructure. There should be ways of sharing that infrastructure to help build FirstNet, we believe. And, and, and other, other uh, fiber projects, uh, including uh, there, there's an entity called Lit San Leandro in the Bay Area, which is a, a uh, private con consortium or private entity, but 
uh, is, is working partnerships with the local jurisdictions there to share fiber. We see those kinds of things are going to be very important to getting this built. Now the second side of this is really going to be what are the opportunities for FirstNet infrastructure that gets deployed to actually be used for broadband access and adoption more generally? Uh, because we believe that if there is collaboration and sharing a lot of this infrastructure, then, then maybe there's an incentive or, or a need for FirstNet to share the infrastructure it deploys for, for other uh, broadband uses, right? Right? So I think there's going to be a, some opportunities there, especially in rural areas. And when I say rural areas, I mean remote rural areas where there are not a lot of people. There's no cell access currently. FirstNet has an obligation to serve those areas. Those areas are needed, you know, public safety needs to be, needs to have communications in those areas. Maybe there's ways to, to pull that, some of the FirstNet infrastructure it deploys into developing broadband access in those areas. Um, finally, I just want to mention spectrum sharing. Uh, FirstNet has a large chunk of spectrum. In urban areas like San Francisco, we'll probably use it all for public safety. But in more remote areas, there could be additional spectrum that could be leveraged or used uh, for other purposes. Um, so there, there are just a lot of opportunities, and all I can say is stay tuned. <laughs> and help play. And, uh, and help play, please. Uh, the FirstNet people that I've dealt with are really pretty aware of the need to bring current industry in infrastructure in. And as we lose the carrier of last resort and all of the traditional regulatory framework, which we will lose, these kinds of collaboration are critical to closing the digital divide in California. We have the equivalent of four states unserved in California. So talking to our next speaker, who is from really representing the kind of community planning rural USDA group that brought us electricity for your parents, um, Dr. Bob, as he is known, is, is really, uh, Bob Sai, is known for trying to make Fresno a place that works. And he's done it, and he is now here to talk about how he did it uh, shortly, because we're running over time. Um, and we were late starting, Adelita, so I'm claiming some of your minutes. But welcome, Bob. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, well, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to give you the soundbite rapid overview of what we have been doing and talk about it, talk about broadband from an agriculture and an ag technology perspective. Um, uh, first though, I, I want to set the context that if you're in the agriculture side that what we look at are the, the world that we operate in. And, it, and I think it's important to take that in mind because it does explain our motivation. Um, if you look at things in a global context, there's maybe four big trends that are out there. Um, that affect us. Three demographic trends. One is population. One is the fact that the world has become more, uh, actually for the first time more than half the population of the world lives in cities. It's on its way to 70 percent. Um, and the rise of the global middle class. Um, for the first time, if uh, things continue as they are, um, we could probably see half the world's population being middle class or middle income by some standard. That changes uh, what they can afford to buy and what they eat. Um, which goes back to agriculture, economic development, economic development um, for us. And then, you know, the fourth uh, sort of planet Earth, Earth change is pretty obvious. It's climate change, and that has a direct impact on agriculture. Um, if you look at where I have focused on in the Fresno area, or the, if you look at the Central Valley, it'll give you a snapshot profile of the Chico to Bakersfield area. The Central Valley is the largest agriculture producing region in the United States. Um, there's a farm gate of almost $35 billion. That's more than what the number three state, and I have to pick on Texas, uh, produces, and that's more than what the number two state, Iowa, produces, or more than 18 U.S. states combined. Um, it's global impact because uh, more than $11 billion from that region is exported in terms of food products. So that ties back to what I just talked about, about global demand. The bottom line is that um, with those four demographic factors, we actually have, the world demand for food is going to double by 2050. And agriculture production is not growing at the annual rate that's going to meet that demand. So there's your dilemma, there's the challenge that we have. 
um, there's only two ways you're going to produce more food. One is more land, the other is greater yield. There isn't really more land, there's maybe 12% more land uh, across the world, arable land available to grow more food. So what does that tell you? It tells you you've got to work on the yield side. That gets you directly to agriculture technology in California. Um, California agriculture, the farmers and, and ranchers in California have always been the leaders in innovation and in adopting uh, new technology. Um, how the production has gone up for all these years, particularly in a state that's inherently very dry, um, has a lot to do with that innovation in ag technology. Um, I'm going to just lay out five different areas of where this ag technology, the new ag technology is, is coming or, uh, or where we're going that also relate to broadband. I talked earlier about the need for increased production or yield. Um, the other one is on the water technology side or irrigation technology, very obvious right now during the drought. Third, third part is environment. Um, there's new technology that can shrink the environmental footprint of agriculture and actually offers carbon trading. Uh, potentially for California farmers. Um, a fourth area is uh, technology involving energy. Um, you can think of it as taking ag waste to bioenergy or more efficient use of energy by farming. That's coming out. And then the fifth, which, mo which most people, and I haven't seen anyone else talk about it, it's actually driven by government regulations. It's in the area of food safety. The, uh, the new Food Safety Modernization Act um, which is focused on prevention of contamination and traceback, and it's run by FDA, those new rules are going to come out, or they're in the process of coming out now. And that's going to have a huge impact on how farming is done, particularly in California. But I think that uh, technology developments are a means of dealing with those rules and enabling farmers to continue to farm. Um, these technologies, the other point to think about is they are interrelated and have multiple benefits. They do not sit in single silos. So if you take a systems approach, um, you're going to see multiple benefits. I'll give you, I guess, well, maybe I'll skip the example. If we have time for discussion, I'll talk about it. This all goes back to rural wireless broadband as a critical platform. And there, our chart is, base, is up there. So all of those layers um, are the different pieces that uh, for the rural economy, are there, it's dependent on. I'm only going to focus on, and I just talked about the ag technology side of that. Um, the driver of ag technology adoption is the presence of wireless broadband in the farm field. And that's the weakest point that we have in California and across the country. That's the barrier to faster and further adoption of this new ag technology. Now what we've done, um, what Barbara talked about, what I've been doing down in Fresno, which is part of a, a White House pilot project called Strong City, Strong Communities, which is a cross-federal government project working with the city of Fresno uh, to help improve its economy. Um, the, f the first accomplishment actually was to, is to, was to get the other federal agencies, which are very urban focused, to take a look at things in a regional concept. Because as Fresno City goes, it's going to go with the surrounding agriculture or the core economy of the region. Um, and so you can't just only focus on the city or, or just stop looking at things beyond the city's border. And uh, one of the connections that we looked at is, to the, is looking at how you're going to get this innovation in ag technology and drive it further or faster. And one of them is, is actually to look at the development of an ag tech economic cluster, essentially replicating what we all talk about and know about, and everyone else tries to replicate Silicon Valley um, and the tech cluster. Well, I, I looked at Silicon Valley and some of the reasons you know, why we think it, it occurred. And um, Silicon Valley, basically, you could say it, it kind of evolved on its own for different reasons. But I think in the case of an ag tech cluster, we don't want to leave it to chance. So we engaged in a deliberate policy to nurture an ag tech cluster in Fresno. And what it offers is, uniquely to California, an opportunity to cross over two of California's key core economic drivers, technology and agriculture, crossed over to ag tech, and, and leveraging uh, the, the regional assets in the area. Now, you've actually got a couple examples um, in the Central Valley um, of this developing. And, there's, and there is actually no reason not to have more than one 
um, in the area. So, so you have Seed Central at UC Davis Ag School, which is leveraging the global expertise on seeds at the university. You have SARTA, the Sacramento Regional Technology Alliance, which started AgStart last year, um, which is leveraging the technology side um, of expertise in the Sacramento area. And then you have what I focused on in Fresno with this Fresno Agriculture Technology Economic Cluster. The, the key to that is actually, again, um, Anne talked about collaboration, and the key to that is federal collaboration. Um, rather than operate in a silo, we actually put together an agreement between three different federal entities, two in USDA, so a USDA California Rural Development and USDA Agricultural Research Service, and the Department of Energy's CIO office. What that got us was access to what I, I think they, an ag tech cluster needs, they need it, and what Silicon Valley and maybe Stanford provides for Silicon Valley, a source of innovation. Where's that gonna be? Well, we're not gonna build a, a Stanford in Fresno. It's not in the cards. But we, we do have a source of innovation. It's known as the federal labs. So Lawrence Livermore Labs, the Department of Energy, and um, the USDA Agricultural Research Service in the Pacific West, which is based in Albany, um, but the whole Pacific West um, is where it is. So what we, we put together an agreement with the three different agencies to collaborate. And then where, where are you gonna take this? Well, what we did is we staged a, um, a Fresno Ag Technology Showcase actually deliberately in City Hall in Fresno with the uh, participation of the mayor of Fresno. And we brought in about 13 to 15 technologies that were developed at those two labs, actually more than, more than two labs, which have an application and focus on agriculture that meets a challenge faced by California agriculture and also utilizes broadband. So that was presented at that showcase and we actually, um, and, and so that's the initial drive for that and our accomplishment. So, um, and that's just the, the beginning of things and it's an example of collaboration. So I, I think what I'll do is, since we're, we're kind of so short Barbara on time. Picked up her mic. <laughs> Barbara picked I saw that, I saw that. Um, I'll just give you my final thoughts uh, on this to summarize it up that I think, um, you know, you've heard all the discussion um, about broadband and capacity, and I think that, you know, the future is wide open for broadband use. And I, say, I would say we cannot overbuild the capacity for broadband. Um, if the telecoms didn't anticipate demand on their networks because they didn't anticipate the smartphone coming out, and now you see consumers driving with Netflix and Hulu as extreme demand and, and think about it even accentuated in rural areas where there's less capacity if there is capacity there. And then look to the future of, with the demands from distance learning um, and telemedicine which offers much better health care in rural areas. Um, so my message on, on this is don't build a narrow gauge railroad track when you need the standard gauge. Um, you know, focus on building capacity. And I'll, I guess I'll stop there. Yes, we're going to try and allow time for questions, but we did start a few minutes late. Um, one of the big challenges for California, and it's just an addendum to what Bob was talking about, is that remember the rules for what is rural were written by the Midwest. And most of our problem is we don't qualify for a lot of Rust funding. So that's a challenge that CETF has been working on. We're trying to get it redefined. But clearly, it's not coincidental that Bob is sitting between FirstNet and the libraries. Because <laughs> even in rural areas, we have first responders and librarians. So I mean, be thinking how you can leverage all of these resources. And last but not least is the head leverager. Um, Trish is fabulous. She is, and I'll just say that and not read her long bio. She is one of our grantees, was one of the executors of CETF with the Sacramento Broadband Coalition. All of our roundtables, she's come and talked to and helped shape. And now she's gone out on her own. She's done everything in the rural areas. She's a principal for Applied Development Economics. And her focus is economic development, but really using clusters of existing resources in the community. So welcome, Trish. Thank you so much, Barbara, and thank you for your leadership in CETF. 
So I think that um, this is such a rich conversation. We're going to ask that we continue to have more dialogue around this with economic development professionals. What I'd really like to do quickly is talk about the two areas that we are working in. One is on the ground. We're economic development consulting firm, so we're working with communities on economic strategies, economic development elements, um, infrastructure financing plans. So those are really where communities are trying to figure out how to make this happen. And we're finding that there's just a huge gap in knowledge that communities have. They don't really know what infrastructure they have. They don't know how much speed is available in various areas. We're finding huge gaps, not only in our rural areas, but in our older downtowns, in our suburban office parks, which are, uh, and industrial areas, which are our regional job centers. So what we're, what we're focusing on is really all the dimensions, and we're working on this through also the regional consortia, which are, uh, there are about 14 in the state. There are going to be a few more, but that's a program that's funded through the Advanced Services Fund, and it's administered through the Public Utilities Commission. So I also work as a consultant with uh, the East Bay Broadband Consortium and the Connected Capital Area Consortium, which is here, and uh, continuing to do work on CETF. So there are a lot of strands. So I'll just quickly try to uh, summarize some of those. Just to say, Sunny McPeak sends her regards. She's sor sorry she's not here. She's the one, she, we say she's the maniac responsible. She got us into this work. In the 90s, there was a lot of, yeah, in the, in the 90s, there was a lot of focus on smart cities and economic development. And then for some reason that kind of dissipated. But in 2005, when Sunny was the cabinet secretary at the Business Transportation and Housing Agency, we had some convenings with our regional partners around what their issues were for um, coming out of the recession and driving prosperity and innovation. And broadband, especially in our rural areas, was the number one foundation. It was a platform technology for economic competitiveness and quality of life. So that really drove a lot of um, what happened after that in terms of the regional approach, connecting all these strands and partnerships. So one of the things that we have uh, been finding working in our communities is that, as you know, the PUC is focused on the household speeds. They're not really focused on business speeds. And household speeds, even if you meet those thresholds, they're not really the speeds that we need to compete in a global economy. So um, we, we used to say connect to compete, but I think we need to say, you know, we need the business speed to compete. So this broadband also, like Robert's mentioning, the, all these regions, uh, our consortia are doing regional strategies, but we have regional economic development strategies that are they're integrating. So, for instance, what Robert's talking about as ag, this region has a food and ag cluster. That's really a critical cluster for us. It's an economic driver. The San Joaquin Valley, that cluster is huge. But we need these plat this broadband platform for all of our clusters, like health and wellness, logistics, um, environmental technology. So. Um, and also, as Robert mentioned, our capacity, our current capacity, even if we're good, it's going to be under tremendous strain in the future. So briefly, I want to just talk about what we're doing here in the um, Sacramento region. Our consortia here is led by Valley Vision. Tara Thronson is our leader here, and she's also with um, Tammy Cronin. So Tara manages not only the, the uh, consortium, but also the Cleaner Air Partnership. So we have a lot of cross-collaboration around uh, relevant areas and Valley Vision is managing Next Economy, which is our regional economic strategy. So as part of our work, we were going out to our rural areas, working with our partners to map our infrastructure gaps. And in Yolo County, the county librarian, Patty Wong, was a fantastic champion and she said, you know, we have a asset in our community, we have a Yolo Leaders Network and we have a city and county managers group. So. What, what if we brought the broadband to this leaders group? So that evolved, we worked with that group, and our big leader is also here, Mayor Cecilia Aguiar-Curry. She is a leader in the leaders group, and so it was a fabulous event, which I missed, unfortunately, but Robert and Sonny were there, and I think it's just, you can see when leadership happens on the ground, where it goes. So the, the, um, the partners decided that they would invest in a YOLO strategic broadband plan. And so what they've done is they are canvassing and surveying both businesses and households about their levels of speed. But uh, cut it to the next level. What are your uh, issues? And they have a group called the Magellan Group uh, that is doing that project. And it's managed through LAFCO. So I don't think a lot of us think of using LAFCO as a partner in our planning efforts. But the planning side is really important. So briefly, I want to just tell you uh, a couple survey results. Three, three of the cities 
Davis, West Sacramento, and Woodland, with almost 100 uh, respondents, businesses, said between 37 and 50 percent in these cities their internet services are not sufficient. Now, you might expect this in a rural community, but Davis is the head of the, our number one agricultural research university in the world. We have um, West Sacramento <coughs> is branding themselves as a global food hub. They have international companies. More than half of these uh, people don't have speeds that even meet the PUC standards. So, and then uh, at least 25% are saying the prices are too high. So that we're not even talking about what happened in the unincorporated areas. So here's a couple quotes. Davis, an IT services company, said, we just upgraded and have still been having issues. We've had to go from paying $45 a month so we could only get slow DSL to paying over $800 a month and still having issues. Woodland had five ag businesses that reported constant internet outages, causing total to moderate disruption of business operations. In West Sacramento, which is kind of a worst-case scenario, we had a company that invested $30 million to build a manufacturing plant in an industrial park. They installed T1 circuits, and they still don't have fiber-based <coughs> service. So they just basically said to the city, it's not adequate to support our North American operations. In the East Bay Broadband Consortium, that's led by three economic development groups. Bayrix is a member. It's really critical, important. We're really trying to have our members that are the anchor institutions with our broadband. Their goal is to close their gaps and also be a center of innovation for advanced communications technologies. They had a strategy where they rated themselves, or they had themselves rated on their broadband infrastructure across the three <coughs> counties in the cities, everything from A to, to F. To huge disparities within the region, not meeting even the PUC standards in a lot of cases. But we do have Lit San Leandro, which is a fabulous model. It's a, it's a, there was a, a business person, Dr. Kennedy, Patrick Kennedy, who was a president of OSI Soft, which is a major company. He said, I don't have what I need. A lot of what they do is help uh, energy companies and businesses manage their energy use. So he started a partnership with the city. They got, a, they got funding from the federal government for infrastructure. They extended their service to their underserved industrial areas. They've connected now almost 2,000, 2 million square feet of space are now connected. And they're using BART infrastructure as well. But they are expanding their fiber now to other communities. And that is an area where the telecom companies thought their industrial areas were served. So you can, this is giving the city a whole different life as a center of location for companies that need high-speed internet. So quickly, I just want to say they have also, they're working now this year on their plan as a Get Fast pledge. They're getting businesses and communities to sign up to get fast and work on policies. I want to just quickly talk about policy alignment to state, to regional, to uh, um, federal. We have, we're seeing this more and more in economic development plans. P communities are saying, what is our capacity? How do we do planning? And they want to know what the policy alignment is. So we're working with a lot of our member consortia, like uh, Santa Cruz County, Mono County, Humboldt County, are developing model policies and ordinances. CETF has done that. So we're really trying to understand and raise our learning. And then we're working with the Governor's Office of Planning and Research through work with Valley Vision to get policy alignment. They're updating their general plan guidelines. We're working with the Air Resources Board on the scoping plan. And we're really saying to the state, if you're going to spend cap and trade funding, think again about investing in broadband as a critical infrastructure to help you meet your environmental and economic goals. So that is the fast version. That was a great fast version. And we had scheduled some questions, but if I do that, you won't have a break. And I do have a PhD in communication. So I think <laughs> we should probably take a break and have the question and answer be a little more informal for right now. But we have a question and answer after both panels are done. So hold those questions um, and go out and get some coffee and walk around a little bit. Thank you so much, um, Barbara and panel members. Um, your information was truly enlightening and definitely something that we all need to take back and look at, especially as we look to develop those really important collaborations and partnerships. So um, we'll be taking a 15-minute break, so we ask that you please return on time since we are running a little behind. Thank you.